Hello, welcome to the lecture series on the poem A Requiem to Mother Earth by OMB Guru. This is the final part of the lecture series and here we will be completing the detailed analysis of the poem. Mother, the first ecstasy on my tongue with your herb and honey, the last drop of water that suits even as the flame of my life is snuffed out. Through these lines, the poet asserts that Mother Earth presides over the entire gamut of human experiences. As soon as a baby is born, it is initiated into this world by the ecstatic taste of Mother Nature's gift. The poet is here referring to the practice of uh, giving a newborn baby a taste of honey and vyamb. Vyamb is a kind of herb. He points out that these are derived from nature. So uh, the first taste of life that we get is from Mother Earth. All our sensations are drawn from Mother Earth and we seldom realize her importance in our life. And then he says, the last drop of water that suits even as the flame of my life is snuffed out. He is talking about the last drops of water that we give to a dying person. And even in the throes of death, it is Mother Earth who comes to ease our suffering. The last drops of water that comfort us as we lie dying come from this mother and yet we fail to appreciate her. I have always marveled at your magic of capturing an infant son in the dew drop on the blades of the karga that spring from you. My lustful fantasies have graced each day in the shade of trees that line you. Like prophets of yore, the wind strode upon your seas. In this stanza, the poet paints the enchanting beauty of Mother Earth. He is captivated by her innate capacity for beauty. He brings in a striking image of how the sun is reflected in the dew drops hanging from the blades of the karga grass. The poet emphasizes that Mother Earth's beauty and magic have always held him spellbound. She is his source of uh, inspiration and has evoked passionate responses from the poet. The sensuous images that she stimulates have motivated his poetic genius. The poet links this ideal of beauty with the higher ideal of eternal wisdom when he imagines the wind stepping on the seas like the prophets of the past. From these lines, it is evident that the poet perceives Mother Earth as the epitome of beauty and a source of sagacity. Mother, I see you in myriad forms. How you remain awake with cradle and lullabies for thousands of tender fruits. How you swing in thousands of orchards and leap on the tips of the leaves of the banyan tree. How you beckon with hands like five petal flowers and coo like the temple doves. How you set the rhythm for the happiness of my soul like the waves in streams of thousands. How you deck the verdant puvaga, ilani, or kona trees in full bloom. How you startle me as the screeching owl and soothe me as the cuckoo's song. How you array a myriad hues in a tiny box to etch figures in the recesses of the mind. How you dip dusks in gold. How you disappear with the even tide into the woods and return with the dawn on your shoulders. How you wake me up and feed me on nectar. How from the heart of the dense forest you craft poems from the self of birds. How you carry me ever so gently like the lotus leaf does a drop of water. I know all this you fill in me, O oh mother. The poet sings a paean to Mother Earth's glorious beauty in a very evocative stanza. He lovingly addresses the various facets of her existence. In a series of strikingly 
magical images, he describes nature in her resplendent glory. She is seen as the nurturing maternal presence who cares for the tender fruits with love. Nature is shown to be singing lullabies. Mother Earth can be seen in the swinging orchards, the tips of the banyan leaves, and the poet imagines her inviting him closer with the five petal flowers that are shaped like hands. She is present at the cooing of the temple doves, and the poet says that it is Mother Earth who sets the rhythm of his soul's happiness like the waves in rivers. He says, how you set the rhythm for the happiness of my soul like the waves in streams of thousands. So the happiness gifted by his mother continues like an endless wave. Everywhere the poet turns, he sees the earth mother in various moods and emotions. She is present in the flowering trees like Ilani, Konna and Puwaga and the sounds and songs of the birds. All the wonderful sights and sounds of nature power the poet's imagination, fuel the poet's imagination. The poet imagines nature arranging a multitude of colors in a small box and visualizes her using these bright and beautiful shades to carve breathtaking images that inspire and stir the human soul. He says, how you array a myriad hues in a tiny box to etch figures in the recesses of the mind. So all the beautiful colors that you see in nature, all these colors are used to inspire the human soul. The poet imagines the alluring shades of morning and evening sky and hails the purest form of poetry that can be found in the songs of the birds. The poet states that Mother Earth protects him through her constant love and guidance. He imagines her caring for him gently like a lotus leaf carries a drop of water without spilling it. She invests that much care for human beings, her children. He sees his mother as a source of life and happiness and understands that without her there is no meaning in his life. What remains immortal in me are your memories. O oh, swan who holds music in your wings, the warm truth blazes that my glory shines forth. If only for a moment from the tips of your beauteous wings, let that be damned. The crow of death beaked even the nectar of your truth. The poet understands the transient nature of human life and realizes the value of the mother's memories that will forever remain immortal. All things mortal will perish in the onslaught of time, but the cherished memories of his mother will forever live through his poetry. He invokes the swan of poetry who holds the gift of poetry in its wings. The swan here becomes a symbol of poetic imagination and the poet wants the truth of his poetry to be an ode to his sincerity. He wishes that the truth will assert itself if only for a brief second. However, his hopes are in vain as the crow of death has destroyed that spark of truth. Crow is generally regarded to be an ominous bird and here it is considered to be a symbol of death. The images of death and destruction loom large as the poet imagines a world on the brink of extinction. As you trudge along the solar highway, an outcast with tonsured head, shouldering the bundle of your shame, weighed down with the sin of having born children who turned mother ravishers, doesn't cruel death creep through your veins? 
Mother Earth is innocent and yet she becomes the symbol of shame. The poet picturizes her walking as an outcast with tonsured head, a head shorn of hair, a shaved head. And this was usually a punishment given to criminals. It's a symbol of shame. The mother is punished for no crime of her own. She is punished on account of her children for the sin of giving birth to such sinners, such savages who have raped their mother. She is weighed down by their sins. She is burdened with the traumas that they have inflicted. The poet wonders whether the mother wishes for the embrace of death. Death is cruel. Yet, as it approaches Mother Earth, she must be ready to welcome it as she cannot bear the atrocities of her children. Mother Earth, not yet dead, this is requiem to you. This song I inscribe in my heart today is a requiem to you and to me. I won't be here to moisten your dead lips with my tears, to mourn your death, therefore, I inscribe as much here, O Mother Earth, not yet dead. In the imminence of your death, may your soul rest in peace, in eternal peace. The poem now comes full circle. The poet understands that this is a dirge, a requiem, both for her and him. He knows that he won't be alive to write a dirge for her, as he will die before his mother. Therefore, he is writing this song now, before he runs out of time. He hopes that his mother's soul will find peace. He hopes that Mother Earth's soul will find peace away from the clutches of cruel children who are bent on destroying her. As the poet is helpless to do anything more, he is doing the only thing that he can, and that is this parting gift, a requiem for his beloved Mother Earth. We have come to the end of the lecture series on the poem, A Requiem to Mother Earth. I hope all of you have understood the poem. Thank you.